Okay, awesome. So I am truly humbled to see this crowd here, and I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. This is really, really cool. Uh, disclaimer, there's only one slide with Java on it, so hopefully that's okay. Um, just to get my, my bearings just a little bit, uh, I like to understand uh, who's in the room, but I asked a bunch of questions earlier. The last one that I'm really curious about is who would, who would say, in, to some degree, that they are a web developer? Like, who would use that title? All right, cool. And yet, uh, there was a big crowd that also said that they were server-side developers. So I think that's pretty interesting. There's a big, big overlap there. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, welcome. My name is Seth Ladd. I'm a developer advocate with the Chrome team focusing on Dart these days. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is really cool for me because I feel like this is kind of a hometown crowd. I many, 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 many years programming Java on the server side for me. That's really where I think I got my start and spent many years. So it's very cool to come back to a, a conference like this and talk to you guys. Um, but then I uh, spent a little bit with Ruby on Rails, but then was lucky enough to get this gig at uh, Google working for the Chrome team. Little did they know I was not a JavaScript ninja, if you will. Again, having a lot of experience on the server side. Um, but it was really cool learning all about JavaScript and HTML5 and the modern browser and what's going on there today. And so I've spent the past couple of years programming client-side stuff. And so it's been neat for me to have kind of the experience and exposure um, across the full spectrum. Um, but when I was programming the browser, uh, I always felt like I wasn't quite getting my expectations met the way that I, I wanted to. I think especially um, I spoiled a little bit working with the tools and the languages we have uh, building. You know, Java is a good example, or C Sharp is another good one. Um, in terms of having structured nature, um, classes, you know, libraries, packages, etc. Uh, and then tools allow you to bounce around the code really easily, refactor, rename, extract method, all that good stuff. And I really, really missed that uh, when I was programming the browser. Even though it's a super exciting platform, uh, I always wanted to, I think, program the way I uh, kind of grew up with. And then so when I heard about this project, Dart, uh, which brings structured programming with great toolability to the browser, so I get kind of the best of both worlds. I jumped all over it. Um, but then there was still this kind of piece that was missing, uh, which was certainly Dart as a language uh, gives me structure at the, um, well, at, the, at the language and runtime level, and the library certainly as well. But when kind of the rubber hits the road uh, in the browser itself, I, I lost some of that encapsulation or structure or reusability that, again, I think we all kind of take for granted programming in uh, tradi traditional uh, structured languages. Um, and so when I heard about this cool thing called web components, I jumped all over that as well because that allowed me to get the encapsulation and true reusable widgets or components that frankly, almost every other uh, system out there already has, and brings it via actually the platform into the browser. I'm very, very excited. So I'm here to share both, both web components and how uh, the Dart runtime and libraries bring all this stuff alive today. And by the way, I really like it when you guys ask questions. So if something's not clicking, please let me know. And uh, it gets a lot more interesting when it gets interactive. So don't, don't be shy. Uh, so today, we're here to talk about web components and Dart. OK, so first, we always have to start off with a demo, of course. Now, here's X Gangnam Style. Uh, that's a tag. OK, so cool. So of course, this works. Um, I feel a little cliche doing this a little bit. But I mean, I'm illustrating a point, so just, just bear with me here. So we, we see this fancy tag up here, uh, X Gangnam Style, which looks like a fancy uh, HTML element. Well, of course, HTML doesn't allow me to just introduce new tags. Or does it? So I'm going to right click on this. Whoops. Sorry, that's going to get annoying real quick. Um, <laughs> that's only seven more times in the presentation. So uh, here we go. Um, do you guys see that? Let me zoom in a little bit here for you. Sorry, let's scroll up again. So actually, in the DOM, in the HTML, explicitly is that x gangnam style tag, which is great. So I've introduced now in into the browser, or sorry, into this page slash app, a brand new term into the lexicon uh, that's available to me in HTML. So you might say, well, what's going on inside? Well, actually, that's it. That is the tag. Now, there is this thing called the document fragment. We can jump inside here. It's these sort of hidden elements in here. We'll talk about what these are, but you can see the color difference. Uh, what I'm highlighting here, X game style, this is the actual tag that the browser and the DOM sees. Inside of it is this hidden shadow world of other DOM nodes and elements and attributes that actually make up the implementation of that tag. 
And right away, you're starting to see some encapsulation. You're already starting to hear these sort of uh, implementation boundaries. And, and uh, so we're starting to bring in this kind of declarative nature of encapsulation into the modern platform. We'll, we'll see how we do this in a little bit. But uh, that, that's really, really awesome. And it's not just static. We saw the animation. We saw the sound, et cetera. OK, something probably not as totally hackneyed as, as Gangnam Style, but uh, here we see an example of x-megabutton, a new tag that we've created, which uh, shows off that you can actually start composing these things. So this has a text node inside of it. So they don't have to be just kind of obtuse uh, elements. You can start to interlace the elements that you've defined with the elements or attributes of the page itself. So if we hover it over here. Whoop. <laughs> OK. But anyway, so it's funny. It's funny because <laughs> it's a moo. <laughs> uh, but what I like about this example here is the previous example was just a, like a, a random element that it created, although quite cool, and you guys can go ahead and use that. But this element here shows the inheritance capabilities of these new custom elements. Uh, this one actually is a button. And one of the things that I've always wanted to do on the web platform since the time that I started was extend button. And now, and I see some nods like, yes, why can't I do that? Well, some of the capabilities we're going to talk about today shows us we can actually start to do that, not just introduce new terms into our lexicon, but extend the existing behavior and capabilities of the browser. Pretty excited by that. So many guys are like, OK, this is cool, but you know, why do we need to do this? And hopefully a lot of you guys are like, yes, we need to do this. But the thing that illustrates this, the, the problem to me the most is this slide right here. Uh, your, your left, uh, is viewing source on Gmail. Now, Gmail is, by all accounts, you know, a very complex, modern, full-featured application. To pull that off, you need something like this. Now, what I would want to see, semantically, what we're trying to say is what's on your right. Just it, There's a list of messages. They have subject and dates. I don't know about you guys, but the version over there on the right, that is a much better way to program the web than the version over here on the left. Now, what I'm, what I'm not saying is that divs are bad or anything like that. But the version over here, this is implementation details. This should be hidden. This should be encapsulated. There's no need for the DOM itself to actually display this, present this as, as the structure of the page. No, we want to talk about a world where you say what you mean. We want to uh, help usher in a declarative renaissance and help bring al along the world over there. So that, to me, says it loud enough. So let's talk about web components uh, and it, as a way to bring about this kind of declarative renaissance in modern web programming. So there's a couple parts of the, where the word web components is really just a, it's a family of new specifications and functionalities getting introduced actually at the platform level. The first one is a template tag, which is a scaffolding or a blueprints. You, know, you can think of this as like inert chunks of DOM. Once you have these inert chunks, of course, you can start doing things like iterating over them and putting them in conditionals and interleaving, etc. But you need a way to actually have templates in your system. Then you have this concept of shadow DOM. Now, once you have templates, you have to somehow inject them into your page. Now, with the shadow DOM, you can uh, create a, that hidden shadow world of implementation details and bind it to a node that actually does manifest itself on the page. And then finally, it kind of all comes together with the element tag. And this is how you define new custom elements and extend the vocabulary of HTML today. And again, bringing about that say what you mean programming style. So let's start here by looking in detail at templates. Now, of course, templates are not a new concept. And that's one of the themes here of today's talk is that we're, a lot of this work with web components is paving the cow paths, if you will. A lot of web development has been trying to do a lot of these things for a while. And if you can bake it into the platform, then, of course, it becomes standard and native. And you no longer need to kind of reinvent the wheel. And then more interesting libraries and, and frameworks can come about. So we've, of course, been trying to do this for a long time. Here's method number one, off-screen DOM. Uh, that is, you, know, you, you create a DOM and you hide it. But this has some, some certain problems. Uh, the first one is that this DOM that's inside your hidden tag is interpreted like every other uh, bit of DOM in your page. So for instance, images are loaded, scripts are loaded and, 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 and parsed. And that's often not what you want with a template. You know, for instance, think about if you load up a template that has some images, but you don't display that template for 10 minutes, why take the hit to go get those 
those images right away. And the other problem with this is this is all flat within the same DOM. And so it's very, very difficult to create these styling boundaries with a template system like this. And the list of problems goes on and on. Okay. Was there a question? No? Um, okay, there's another way. There's many ways. There's another way that people try to accomplish the same thing, and they do it through overloading the script tag. Well, we think that this has problems because you're, inter a, you're, you're completely bastardizing the use of the script tag. Uh, you're parsing uh, a bunch of text here as script. You can easily introduce XSS uh, issues, and runtime string parsing is always not, not a good thing. So we said, OK, clearly people want to do templates. How do we bring those about in, in, into the platform itself? Well, introduce a template tag. Uh, this, it's an inert set of, a set of markup. So even if you do have things like images in here, the content inside the template tag is parsed uh, and created into kind of an inert document fragment, but it doesn't activate it or execute it. Now, of course, once you have this template tag in itself, or the contents of the template tag is itself a document fragment, it's very easy to then treat it like any other thing you would in your DOM or your web browser. And this is another great theme about these new capabilities we're adding to the platform. You can play off and extend things already baked into the browser. Things just move a lot more smoothly. So uh, while these ideas and concepts may be pretty revolutionary, I think the actual implementation of this stuff and the actual kind of delta between what you're doing now and, and the new concepts you have to learn are actually pretty small. Uh, so here's a good example. You can just go ahead and clone the node like you could clone any other node and attach that template content right into your DOM. Pretty straightforward. Okay. So we think that's kind of money. <laughs> I could just stare into those eyes all day. Okay. <laughs> All right, so th th those are templates, a nerd set of DOM. The next up is shadow DOM. Now, this is probably the most complex uh, concept, so we're going to try to ease into this. So it turns out that browser vendors have actually been holding out on this. It turns out that browser vendors today actually have this kind of concept of the shadow netherworld that's underneath your DOM, um, and they use it to build... Here we go, here we go, here we go. There we go. Um, they use it to build some of the components that we actually use today. So the perfect example here is this video player. Um, if you're familiar with HTML5, you'll know that this is a just video tag, so bracket video, uh, which is great. You know, I just want to declare that there's a video in here. But actually, underneath the covers, if we dive in, and this is just the dev tools, uh, which has a flag turned on that says, show me the shadow DOM. Underneath the covers, there's actually a set of divs in here, and some of these divs deal with the button. And so we're actually able to render the more higher level composed widgets like the video player out of what the browser already gives you, that is divs and buttons and inputs. And that's fantastic. So the browsers have been doing this, and why, why, wouldn't, they? why wouldn't they? I mean, it's a lot easier to use the div, divs in here and buttons in here than it is, I think, to write a whole bunch of C++ code. Um, whoop. Sorry, this is annoying. There we go. Um, OK, and then so it uses in other cases here, like, uh, like the date, uh, widgets, and selectors too. So the browsers already have this concept of reusing the di uh, divs and elements and buttons, et cetera, to build out higher level functions. So the shadow DOM just actually exposes this to us. So we ourselves can build higher, uh, higher more complex elements that are made out of the basic building blocks of the browser. And of course, this means it can encapsulation, which again, is nothing new. It's not a new concept. But the fact that we're actually getting in the browser is going to completely change the way we build this stuff. So let's look at this. So the green nodes here are the actual document tree. This is the DOM that you know, you're familiar with, and you would walk with your tools, et cetera. The pink nodes, this is the shadow DOM. And, and individual elements from the green, the normal, or the light DOM, uh, can they themselves host a shadow DOM or subtree of, of nodes? So yes. So here's, uh, this just shows that even though the, the DOM that we all see, the green node underneath, might have a shadow DOM, it's the shadow DOM that's actually rendered, much like we saw with the video tag. Even though there's all those divs and buttons in the video tag, they them, even though they're hidden in the shadow DOM, they still make up the rendering and display of the element. And this just highlights it again. If you have a shadow root, which is the green node, itself has a shadow DOM, a bunch of pink elements. Underneath that shadow root is a whole bunch of those elements. 
OK, so it turns out it's very easy to create shadow DOMs. Again, you can do it off of any other element. We typically call those the host elements because they host the shadow DOM. Uh, simply create a shadow root. And then off of that root, again, you have this little document fragment. And you can assign some HTML to it, whatever you would like. Uh, in this case, remember, the shadow DOM is what's actually rendered out. So the top example here is the DOM that's statically in the HTML page. Notice how it says my title and my subtitle. But the JavaScript here in the middle creates the shadow uh, creates a shadow root, attaches a bunch of HTML to it, and that itself is what is being rendered. So we replace the, any uh, static elements from the original host element. And I, I realize it's ironic that this slide is probably the least sexy, unstyled slide ever. But I have a point. And the point is, uh, once you have these kind of nice boundaries, they're not just great for encapsulation of the structure of the element. They're great for encapsulation of the styles of the element as well. And so the Shadow DOM really does a nice job with uh, CSS styles in terms that you can assign uh, styles here. You can see it right there in the inner HTML for this Shadow DOM. And those styles are only applied to the shadow DOM of that element. And now you're encapsulating styles at the shadow DOM boundary, which I think is fantastic. And notice how it doesn't bleed out into the rest of the page. And uh, this is, I think, you know, one of the problems with um, some of the earlier uh, template systems that we showed earlier. It doesn't have that nice styling boundary. Now, it turns out that it, it's much more than just a simple kind of brick wall boundary. With with the Shadow DOM and its scope style sheets, you can interlace styles as well. And that, I think, is the real power. Because up to this point, you're like, yeah, I could do this with iframes, sort of, even though there's a lot of issues with iframes. But what you can't do with iframes, and what's really slick about this stuff, is you can start to mix and match the styles of the host page with the styles of the Shadow DOM. And there's a couple different uh, triggers there. One is reset style inheritance, which says, you know, if you set that to true, say, forget about anything the page is saying. Let me just start to control all this stuff. And then apply author styles, apply styles uh, that the author itself specifies in the host page and kind of interlace it or let it bleed into your element. Now, the really neat thing about this is that you, as a custom element author, can dictate the amount of control and interlacing that you want to allow your uh, embedder of your custom element to use, giving you utmost control, but the uh, embedder um, author's utmost uh, style and flexibility. Uh, OK, so I'm going to skip over some of these things here. OK. Um, it turns out also that the browser has been doing this other uh, tricky thing here called custom pseudo elements. Um, now, for instance, here's a, here's a range slider. Uh, one of the great banes of CSS development is how do you style the uh, browsers, cut, like the more fancy kind of input elements like dates and range sliders. Well, if you really dig into the actual source code, you'll find that there's these pseudo elements like WebKit slider thumb. Firefox has some similar ones as well that allows you to go ahead and style uh, things like the range slider to be very specific to your application. Now, this is great because this technique has been applied to the Shadow DOM as well. So you, as a Shadow DOM author, can declare the, the presence of pseudo-selectors. Again, that's what's down in here, and which allows the implementer of your custom element, say, to style you know, deep inside of your Shadow DOM without understanding the structure of your Shadow DOM. Again, encapsulation. Bringing this to the web platform, super powerful stuff. OK, another great hook uh, is CSS variables. I really like this one because it makes theming really, really easy. Uh, the bottom example here is a bunch of CSS. Um, am I saying this right? Uh, sorry, the, the one at the top, let's start with that one. The one at the top says, OK, as a Shadow DOM author, I can say, OK, there is some color to buy, defined by some variable. And I'll let the, uh, the person who's using me define what that variable is. And then, of course, the embedder or the person who uses your Shadow DOM can then say, OK, I'm going to set a bunch of these variables. And then that's how you can uh, impact the actual style declarations of the Shadow DOM. Again, allowing the author of the Shadow DOM to define the right kind of points and abilities for interlacing and overriding these styles without actually violating any of the encapsulation principles, which is 
I think really, really fantastic. So um, this brings us back to the host node that we're talking about. That top example, when we assigned a uh, shadow DOM to the host node, we wiped out completely his contents. And I've been talking about this whole interlacing concept with styles. Well, it turns out that we can also do a interlacing concept with the structural elements of the shadow DOM as well. So there is a way for us to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to define a shadow DOM, but I'm going to set their particular insertion points or just kind of markers for for me to go back out to the host's DOM's children, pull them in, and slide them into my shadow DOM so I can interlace appropriately. That was a lot, so let me see if I can show an example of that. Okay, so the version on your left here, uh, the host has the H1, the H2, and the div. Now I'm going to implement a shadow DOM over on your right, and I'm going to define content tags. And they might have selectors, like select H2. These content tags are the insertion points. That's where I want to say, OK, I know I'm defining my own structure that's encapsulated inside the shadow DOM. But I'm going to go ahead and pull out particular elements and their values from the host node. Well, why is this important? Well, you may not know all the details uh, when you're implementing a shadow DOM. You may want to say, go ahead and use my custom element. Um, but you may know how, what your title is supposed to be. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a content or insertion point for the title, and I'll take care of everything else. Again, allowing you as the author to define exactly how these things are interlaced without violating any encapsulation. So yeah, cha-ching. And I also, when I always look at these things, I always stare in the background. Like, there's a dude making pizza back there. And who, what's his story? I don't know. <laughs> I want to meet him someday. OK, so now we've talked about some of these elements, like um, <laughs> elements, um, like the template tag, and scope style sheets, and insertion points, and shadow DOM. That's all kind of the, the low-level infrastructure getting out of the platform. And you can certainly use that low-level infrastructure. But where all kind of comes together in a really delicious layered lasagna is custom elements. And custom elements, it, you can encapsulate three things. You can encapsulate the structure. That's the template tag. You can encapsulate the style. That's the scope style sheets. And you can encapsulate the behavior. This is any script tags may define. And this all rolls up into a nice new element that you get to create and encapsulate all of this great stuff. So it turns out that, again, if we're in HTML, we can add a new HTML element called element. And this is how we can define new, new tags. So in this one, there's a very simple example. Uh, element name x dash tags, or sorry, tabs. Uh, a note here, the agreement with the HTML spec guys, um, anything that, any custom element names you guys create will require a dash of someone in, somewhere in there. So um, that's how you can sort of visually distinguish between custom elements and those baked into the platform. Uh, regardless, um, custom elements can define a template. That's their structure. Now, how to use it? Again, this is HTML, and this is the DOM. And if we already have a bunch of capabilities, let's not reinvent anything. Let's use what we have. So we have this great link tag in HTML, and you can have different relationship type links. Well, why not use that uh, for components? So if you have the top, uh, the top element tag in an HTML file, go ahead and link that into your kind of host page. And boom, now you have access to new custom elements, and you just define them like you would any other DOM node, x dash tabs, and it all just works, which is very, very cool. Now, OK, so I talked about encapsulating structure, style, and behavior. Let's talk about behavior. So custom elements can extend existing elements. So you can have fancy button extends button, um, which is fine. You can interact with it like a button. But you may also want to interact with a custom imperative API. Well, you can do that as well. It all works pretty straightforwardly in JavaScript here. Uh, you can define a constructor. And then you can define new APIs you might call on that actual element. And this, I think, this, this totally drives the point home for me, which this is, this is totally what I want. Oh, well, well, this too. Well, actually, all of it. But <laughs> it's all really good. Um, so again, if, if they themselves are elements, uh, they themselves are objects. You can instantiate them with nice constructors. And remember, it really is an element as far as the browser is concerned. So you can work with these things like you would any other element. And then you can call methods on it like you would any other element too. And it's just so fantastic to finally be able to extend button. <laughs> Just that one little thing. Um, OK, th this drives the point home. You can extend elements as well. OK. OK, so I'm doing OK. Um, so this is all awesome. And of course, you guys are like, how do I get access right now? I want to start encapsulating. I want to start creating templates and, and new elements and actually say what I mean. And I want to bring forth the declarative renaissance. So the good news is that a lot of this functionality, like the shadow DOM and the template tag, these are coming to Chrome really soon. 
The other really good news is this is not just a Chrome thing. These things are on the spec track, and the other browser uh, vendors are very interested in this work. In fact, Firefox Mozilla uh, has this great X tags project as well, which you can look at. And so this, it's very, very, I have a very good optimistic feeling about this. Um, but there is another option to bring this stuff alive today. And of course, one new family of exciting features? Why not two? Let's up the ante. So this is where we start to talk about Dart. Now, Dart is our batteries-included platform for building structured, scalable web apps. It's much more than language. There's libraries, tools, uh, virtual machine, an editor, package manager. Uh, and it all compiles to JavaScript. So it deploys across the modern web. But there's another really cool thing about this, though, is the fact that we have this compile step to compile everything to JavaScript, we can actually also compile all the great web components work that uh, you might build with custom elements and custom templates and all that stuff. We can actually also compile that all back down to vanilla JavaScript and vanilla HTML, which is great. So that means that via the Dart tool chain, you get to use actually all the stuff we're talking about today in apps that run across modern browsers. And you don't have to wait for them all to implement uh, these really cool features. So it's very cool. And I think this audience, I think, will appreciate, uh, will appreciate the design of Dart as well. So the question we always get with Dart is, why are you guys building new language? In which we say, why progress? Why innovation? Um, <laughs> uh, but, but really, it's about we really want to help more developers from more platforms platforms, build more complex, interesting, full-featured, offline-enabled, 60 frames per second modern HTML5 apps for the modern web. And these are just some of the screenshots of the types of apps I think should be able to be built by anybody in this room with relative ease and happiness today. This should be possible. And we're building Dart to help make that possible. So I'm going to try to blow through this Dart stuff as quickly as I can to get back to the how do you actually do all this web component stuff. So forgive me if I go a little fast. Um, OK, so there's one Java slide, so I don't feel so bad. Um, now, of course, you probably wouldn't write this code exactly like this, but I need to illustrate a couple of points. And so I'm, here is an equivalent yet more of the Dart code. Now, right away, you can say, oh, OK. That's cool. In fact, that actually looks a little bit boring, which is exactly the point. Uh, we took a little flack when we launched Dart. People were like, why didn't you build the next Haskell? And we said, well, we wanted more than five users. So we knew that we needed to have curly braces and semicolons. But you know, as all you guys, I think, can attest, you're probably, OK, I think I can read that. Uh, but you know, we don't have to just completely uh, make it just totally pedestrian. Uh, we can say, hey, this is a chance to, I think, um, clean up some of the stuff that we might be dealing with. So I'm going to point out a couple of features. Uh, yeah, I'll just use this. OK, a couple of features that I think really uh, sell it. So right away, we have full uh, support for classes. So that's really cool. Um, OK. What do we always do in constructors? This.x equals x, this.y equals y. This is getting really boring. So of course, uh, and we always name the, the method parameters the same as the fields for your class. So when Dart says, hey, if they're the same, then just simply put this dot in front of the constructor parameter. And we'll take care of, this is syntactic sugar for we'll take care of this dot amount equals amount. So I love that. The next great thing is named constructors. Now, Dart is an uh, optionally typed dynamic language. Uh, which means you don't have method overloading, which is not a big deal in methods because, of course, you can create any named methods you want. Uh, but in constructors, typically, in traditional structured languages, uh, the name of the constructor is the name of the class. Uh, so we introduce name constructors here to help differentiate the different types of constructors and what they may do, which I love because, for instance, you might think of an object you might have um, that can take a string that might be either be XML or JSON. So in Dart, you can easily say, you know, person dot uh, from JSON or person dot from XML, even though they both take strings. So the call site itself gets, gets really, really clear. Uh, we're going to jump down here. We have uh, method overriding. Um, so you can do plus, minus, et cetera. Uh, and then actually this and the two string here use the fat arrow syntax for simple one line functions. Excuse me. Uh, so this is just syntactic sugar for return amount dot two string, et cetera. Now these simple fat arrow one line functions are perfect for things like event handling uh, when you want to kind of inline the handling of callbacks or events. Um, and then one other thing I think just to point out here in the syntax, uh, this bad boy right here wrapped in curly braces is an optional parameter. So you may or may not, or you can or cannot uh, pass in charge tax. And because it's an optional parameter, we also have default values, in this case, false. 
So hopefully it looks familiar, but also cleans up and adds a little bit nice syntactic sugar and terseness. OK, one of, uh, who knows JavaScript? And who knows what this would do if this was JavaScript? This would, this would blow up. In, in Dart, we have lexical this, which is fantastic. So in Dart, what you see is what you get. How you write the code, statically analyzable. And it's completely, everything's lexical scope, including this. And so everything just works. And oh, this is the old syntax. OK, I'll change that. Um, <laughs> note to self. OK. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier that Dart was an dynamic, optionally typed language. Now, what does that mean? You can start writing your programs without the use of static type annotations, which is great because at the very beginning, when I'm just starting out my brand new idea that I'm going to sell to Y Combinator for a jillion dollars, I don't want to have to worry about cumbersome complex class hierarchies right when I get started. I don't have to worry about abstract class factory class factories and all that stuff. I just want to start writing code that works. Once I get comfortable with the design, and things start to lock down, then I start adding the type annotations in. So when we say it's a scalable language, that's kind of what we mean. Now, of course, you can write code like the top, uh, but then you better pray somebody wrote comments in there. Uh, but then even if they did write comments and the tools don't know how to read it, and so what we generally recommend is use the type annotations like this and like this, et cetera. Here's the return type. Uh, use, the, uh, use the type annotations at the surface area of your code. So any code that you're going to give to another developer so they interact with, use the type annotations, and I think we all can attest to why that is good. Okay, so uh, back to the browser, making our way back to kind of web components here. Uh, when you build a new language and new libraries, like with full collections, et cetera, um, we want to take this opportunity to also make programming the browser feel very natural and native uh, to Dart programming as well. Everyone knows the DOM. Uh, the DOM is language agnostic, which means it never feels very natural to anybody programming in an actual language, which partly explains why jQuery is so popular. It made programming the DOM feel like JavaScript. So we can make programming the DOM feel like Dart. And again, if we have actual uh, support baked into the platform for real collections, then why not use those same collections and their semantics and APIs for the browser? So uh, we can use real constructors like new button element. And uh, if classes is just a collection of CSS classes, then this is an actual Dart list. And you can interact with those CSS classes like you would any other Dart list, add, remove, index, all that good stuff. Um, here's a good example of how you might handle an on click. Uh, so dot on click dot listen. Now what's going on here, this is using our streams API for a stream of events. When you bake into the platform these abstractions that everyone can use, so now um, HTML events, file I.O., network I.O., all these things can now all use exactly the same type of API. So programming the browser feels like programming Dart. And even child nodes can be themselves Dart collections. So I guess the point here is if you know how to program Dart, then you'll know how to program the browser. But we uh, seem to be repeating button here all the time. So again, well, I think we can be a little bit more terse and helpful. And for all you small talkers in the room, uh, we brought along method cascades as well. And so what I like about this is it's really fantastic for builder type APIs. Like the DOM, is all, you're always doing DOM stuff like set the ID, set the classes, set a display property, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the neat thing about the double dot syntax here is they all apply to the first expression before that first double dot dot. But then the really neat thing is what's actually returned from this whole thing here is that first expression, which is why button is equal to new button element, which happens to have you know, text classes, et cetera, set up. So I like this. I really like this. It's nice syntactic sugar. OK, we're getting, we're getting close. Um, so now that you're writing browser programming, you might be saying, well, how do I get? Oh, yes, question up the top. Um, is there someone in the back can drop the spots on the screen? Is the font hard to see? I don't know. Sorry. I, I'm not sure. I can try to... Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, we'll see what I can do when I pull up another slide. Um, okay, so we can compile all this stuff to JavaScript via our Dart to JS compiler. So everything we're talking about here today gets deployed across the modern web, mobile, and desktop. Now, that's all cool, but of course, the compilers like GWT or Dart to JS are spitting out code generated by machines for machines, which means it's been obfuscated and minified, et cetera. Now, that is hell on people that want to debug stuff. So our Dart to JS compiler also spits out a source map. 
Now, a source map is a really cool file that says, okay, take the input, uh, the Dart code, and map it to the output, which is JavaScript. And so that you can say, okay, this line over here actually maps to these lines, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is this important? Well, we can go over to the Dart editor, and this hopefully looks really familiar. So part of the Dart project is uh, an editor that's been um, built to help you edit uh, Dart code. Also, IntelliJ has a Dart plugin as well. But what I'm going to illustrate here, I'm just pulling up one of the samples. And we're going to run as JavaScript. So it's compiling the Dart code into JavaScript here. OK, kind of cool. We got some solar system stuff. But uh, again, so this is stock Chrome. This knows nothing about the Dart language or the Dart virtual machine or anything. So we're going to open up uh, DevTools. I'm going to break this out. And we're going to go to source. And already here, listing in the sources of DevTools, we see Dart, 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 which is actually kind of cool because that means my DevTools, even though it doesn't know anything intrinsically about Dart, it's being told via the um, sorry, let me make this bigger via the source map that hey, you know, hide the JavaScript that's generated and present to the the developer, the debugger, all the great Dart code. So let's just scroll down to. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a good place here. Yeah, okay, so let's set a breakpoint. Ah, so I set a breakpoint on Dart code in Chrome DevTools, which via the source maps actually sets the right breakpoint in the JavaScript, and you can see that the program itself stops running. And we can use traditional kind of debugging uh, as well as we can move through this. Okay, we see the planets changed and all the cool X and Y stuff. So I guess the point here is that, yes, we're writing Dart code. Yes, we're compiling JavaScript, but the debugging story is still really good. Let's kill that and go here. Okay. So another really neat feature, if you've got a statically analyzable language uh, with optional types and a strong tool set, is you get to deal with a problem that plagues web development today. So to set it up here, size, of course, is incredibly important to... Um, to any web app developer. Now, this is why if you go to any, say, JavaScript library out there, the, the top marketing material they always have is um, how small they are. You know, jQuery gets to Zepto. Zepto goes to Dojo, which has literally, I think, something they call Nano. Um, well, that's good. Of course, you want to pay attention to the library, but you're still paying the complete library tax every time you include one of these, these libraries in there. Well, it turns out that, again, if you have a statically analyzable language, you can perform a technique called tree shaking, which takes a holistic look, a whole world look at your program, follows it from the start all the way through the possible paths, including all of the LinkedIn or imported libraries, and generates a pruned or tree shaken version of that application such that it only contains the code and the function and classes that you actually use in your program. So this, this, this here uh, illustrates it. We're importing a library, which itself has some methods, and our, even our program has some methods that are never used. And what's generated in the output is simply just the main function and the two functions that we actually call. And our Dart toolchain actually does this for you. So you can now start looking at libraries and packages that people make in terms of how good they are versus in, instead of how femto they are. So I think that's kind of cool. Okay, one last demo of uh, the Dart ecosystem here is our package management. Uh, we, we affectionately call it pub because you play darts in a pub. Um, but the neat thing about this is just like Node has NPM and, and Java has Maven and Ruby has uh, gems, we have a neat system called pub. And I'll just illustrate that really quickly. Uh, let's load up an app here. I've only written seven lines of code, but I've imported three different packages. Each one of these packages I didn't write, but I was able to uh, go ahead and use a simple YAML file to declare those dependencies. And if we go up here, the toolchain, and you know, don't, don't be fooled, you can run all this stuff on the command line too. I just happen to like running all this stuff. So now it's going on to the interwebs, and it's downloading all the packages, symlinks everything. So when we go back, ugh, that's a bug. <laughs> okay, now they're gone. Okay. Um, and now we can run the program, and here, everything just works. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. Um, <laughs> but what's really awesome about this is I only wrote seven lines of code, and of course, again, talking to, I think, a Java audience, you guys, of course this should just work like this. But the, the widget itself is a package, the frame itself is a package, the cat pick itself is a package, and because you have classes and libraries all baked into the language, you can compose these things very, very simply and know while you're editing if it's going to work. So I, I really like it. And, and you can go on to pub, you can see database drivers on there and, and crypto stuff and all this, all this neat stuff. 
Okay, cool. Oh, and we have a virtual machine um, to run Dart code natively. There's no compile step. It's, it's more like uh, Ruby or Python. You just run the code. And of course, if you're building a new VM, and the guys that uh, are building the Dart VM and the start... Um, are leading the Dart project are actually also the guys that built V8 and Hotspot. So if anyone knows how to make stuff fast, I think it's these guys. And it's still early, but I, th I think we have a good, good runway here for us. OK, cool. So that's the short, 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 short version of Dart. Let's bring it back to Dart with web components. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. Uh, but for me, it's about programming with tools and a library and languages that exactly meet and exceed my expectations, especially coming from my background and also building with these encapsulated reusable components and widgets on the web today. Okay, so that brings us to Dart Web UI. This is really where the rubber hits the road. The Dart Web UI package is a web components polyfill, uh, which means uh, polyfill is, is um, library or code that makes a new feature available to developers today. Um, so you don't have to wait for everyone to go implement the stuff. But on top of the web component stuff, the stuff that we saw earlier, which was like declarative new elements and templates, Web UI also has declarative dynamic data-driven two-way live data binding. I think that was a lot of buzzwords, but um, we'll see an example of that in, in, in a moment. Uh, this is very similar, I think, to Angular, if you guys are familiar to Angular. Um, and something that's very important to us is very fast developer cycles. Um, one thing I want to make crystal clear, and we'll see in a minute, is that because we're talking about a compile step does not mean you have to wait for any of this stuff to happen. In fact, right now it's, it's on the order of hundreds of milliseconds to make all this stuff work. Um, and was, as is the common theme with all this stuff, it all compiles a vanilla JavaScript and HTML and works across modern browsers today. Cool, let's get to the demo. So the very first thing we're going to show is simple data binding. And do, 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 do. How are we doing so far? OK, cool. All right. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Let's see the first one here. So this is data binding. Um, here's the, how's that? OK. OK. Uh, this is a HTML file, a hello world. A couple of things I want to point out to you. The double curly braces. This defines the data binding. So I have some variable called superlative that I want its value to appear here. And I want not only its value to appear here once, I want it to be live bound. So anytime I update superlative, I want the infrastructure to go um, update this point in the HTML right here. Uh, another neat bit here is the declarative event handling on-click equals change it which does what it says. So let's look at the code here. So th this is the, I, I think one of the important points about this is very declarative embracing the DOM, right? So it's all just in the HTML. Here's the Dart code that you would write to make this work. Uh, here's the superlative variable that we're talking about. Um, here's the change it uh, top level function. Neat thing about Dart, uh, top level functions just work, so you don't have to wrap everything in classes. Um, and when this runs, it simply says, you know, set the superlative variable from some random set of alternatives. OK. Uh, doo -doo. So let's go up uh, to the compiled version, and let's just run this. OK, MDV. MDV stands for Model Driven Views. It's a series of techniques and behavior to do basically what it says, take your models and drive the views dynamically. Uh, let's go ahead and click that button. And of course, it's all working. And of course, the random, it sometimes picks the same number. But you get the idea. Um, but the neat thing here is that I only declaratively set up the button. And I said, when it's clicked, go call this method. And then the other thing I declared is, hey, put whatever is in superlative here. But the web UI package, which is what's driving all this, uh, has all the data binding watchers. It has the dispatcher and sets up all the generated code for us to make all this stuff work. Um, so that's cool. Uh, let's gonna skip over this because I'm running out of time here. Conditionals. Okay, this is a good one. Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Conditionals. Okay, so here's another HTML file. Again, it all really starts in HTML, which is hopefully a common theme here. Just be very declarative, work with the DOM. Um, here we go. So we've got a div here that I want itself to be a template, but I want this template to only render if language choice is not null and language choice is not empty. So again, just being very declarative about all this stuff. But remember the templates from earlier, this is, exact, this is what we're talking about here. And then we also have a uh, uh, one-way one -way data binding here from the selects value to set this language choice. So you can reason about this application simply by looking only at the HTML, which is really cool. If the select ever changes, update the value to language choice. And then 
if language choice is ever not null or uh, empty, uh, render the contents in this template. So we can do this one really quickly as well. Now this stuff's been all, actually, here, I'm going to show a demo, okay. Okay, so uh, this is the dark code for person, and then notice how I have nothing selected, so the template isn't rendered, and when I do have something selected, the template does render. But let me just show you how fast this workflow is. Uh, hello, JFocus. Okay, ready? Saving the file, going back over here, reload. Boom, it's that fast. And it, what happens is the editor is watching for changes to all these files. If it notices any of my source files change, it kicks off this build script, itself written in Dart, which runs the, the, uh, the compiler to all the vanilla JavaScript. And by the time I get back over and reload the page, it's all working. And so that's what we mean by that really fast developer time, which is really important to web development. Web development is much, I mean, the reload is your compiler. Okay, I am so out of time. So, um, do, 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 do. Okay, let's see one more. Let's show the custom elements here. Um, and we're going to load up the ludicrously simple to do. I think to do is like the new, what you always have to write. Um, but this is a little bit more complex than that. It kind of pulls it all together. So, here's my ludicrously simple to do app. Um, here, let's just put this in here so it makes it quieter. Um, let's see, I've got a button to create new to do items. I've got a list of to do, and here's my custom element, a to-do item, and I'm binding in the Dart object, uh, the model object that is a to-do item, into this new custom element here. So let's just look at what this is. Here's our custom element. It has a name. It has a template. It has a script that points back over to the behavior. Here's where we define the actual behavior of the element that we are uh, creating in our world. And notice how this is very much like an MVVM pattern. So we have our models, and then we have our view models, which are essentially the custom tags. So let's just go ahead and run this. We see all this uh, running. Here we go. And I'm running in Dartium, which is built of Chromium with the Dart VM in it, which makes testing even faster. So learn Dart. OK, you attended my talk. So whoops, check, done. So anyway, uh, custom elements, data binding, uh, real nested models, all that stuff just works. OK, cool. Probably okay. I, I think I can squeeze this in. Um, if you've ever seen the to-do MVC, uh, we have an implementation of that. Everyone's implemented, implemented this. But what I really like here is, who's familiar with Twitter Bootstrap? Okay, awesome. So Bootstrap is a very easy to use set of CSS conventions, but also some dynamic widgets. So of course the light bulb should be going off and saying, hey, dynamic widgets, we have web components. And so we've implemented almost all, if not all, the dynamic widgets in Bootstrap actually as reusable web components. And now the dream has finally come true, right? This is really, really cool. So you can actually deal with it in terms of custom elements, X accordion, X collapse, and it just all works, and it's just so beautiful. You say what you mean. You don't have to deal with any of that. And then the custom element itself implements the dynamic code required to make this stuff work. So you don't have to go get this other JavaScript file and include it in. It just all is encapsulated very, very nicely. OK, so the summary here. Web components, they're coming to the web platform, composable, declarative, and reusable. You can, of course, build with them without Dart, uh, as you saw on all the earlier stuff. It's JavaScript as well. Um, but we also think you might be interested in this thing we call Dart for structured, scalable, and familiar web programming. And we think they go really, really well together. In fact, it's one of the only ways to bring a lot of this stuff alive today and deployed across modern browsers. So hopefully you give everything a try. All this Dart stuff is open source, very permissive license. Um, uh, everything you saw today is all available in the package manager. And uh, we crave feedback. We love it. We're an open source project on purpose. And so please do let us know what you think. And again, I really appreciate everyone's time. I'll be hanging around here for questions afterwards. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. That's all I got.